Chris, welcome. Okay, welcome to uh, CS 4510, lecture 11A. I'm running a little bit behind. Uh, today's lecture, so basically, this is supposed to be like four lectures. Okay, so in the spring, um, this was one lecture, but I like it a lot, and there's a lot of little details and little, little missing pieces that I think it deserved two lectures, so like an hour and 20, 120 minutes. But then I thought, you know, it really deserves three ish and a half. And then I only like even numbers. So it's actually going to take four lectures. So it's going to seem, today's lecture is kind of extra. The next three are more important than this one. This one is totally on something uh, we only need a motivation from. We don't really need, uh, I don't really care about today's topic, but we need to know where we're coming from. It's called a crisis in geometry. Uh, also, I've updated the schedule um, slightly to, uh, to account for these uh, four lectures. So basically, like um, uh, last time we talked about diagonalization, we talked about countability. Um, we talked about how maybe the f mathematics seemed a little shaky because now there's two infinities, and that seems weird and unnatural and perhaps not allowed. Um, so people began to look kind of closer at... Uh, uh, all of mathematics, and this is really uh, where it starts. So we're going to tell a story of a project in mathematics that began like, uh, so today's really a history lecture. It began like 300 BC, and it went to 1936, um, which is when Alan Turing published his paper on computable numbers, and that's where we're end, but first we have to start somewhere. So we're going to start 300 BC uh, with who else? The Greeks. We're going to start with Euclid. So Euclid was, uh, you know, Greek, old guy. Um, he's famous for writing this book called The Elements. And The Elements were a treatise, treatise several, several, several volumes, I think six books, on uh, what we now call Euclidean geometry. So today's lecture really is about uh, Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is the natural, intuitive geometry uh, to us. It's the way the world appears, uh, or at least to a flat earther, it appears. It is, it, it is the study of objects which can be embedded on the plane, right? So you have a triangle, and then you have a circle, and then lines, or whatever. Um, but the motivation, uh, so the natural world appears to be made up of circles, triangles, and lines, and so on. But... Um, the elements are, are, what, are what is called an axiomatization. Axiomatization? I don't think that's spelled right. But basically, you have uh, some set of rules, something, and you want the rules to describe the world that you observe. So you have some observations about triangles and circles and squares and rectangles and right angles and... Uh, ang angles in general, and the relationship between triangles and their interior angles and so on. Um, but then you come up with a set of rules which attempts to model uh, what you witness. It's, it's a model of uh, what you observe. So, uh, but when you are studying the axiomatization, uh, when you're studying your system, you're, you're, you don't have to, you don't get to go by um, your own intuition, which was used for the axioms, you have to go by the way the axioms you defined it. So an axiom, uh, in general, is a statement which is too minimal to be proved. So an axiom is a statement that says, assumes true. Today, we have several axioms of... Uh, Everything, sets and arithmetic. We'll talk about that extensively today. But an example is associativity of addition. So write A plus B plus C is equal to uh, A plus uh, B plus C. Right? It doesn't matter what the order. You can combine quantities in. At the end, you'll get the same result. That's an axiom. It's too small to prove. And it doesn't, it's not even sure how you would prove it. But you can assume it for free, and then you don't ever have to prove it. Anytime you need to call it, you can just say it's true. 
So Euclid goes through his axiomatization of geometry. He, he first has to do definitions. So he has, I think, 26 or 29 definitions. He says, uh, so first off, we have to come up with a definition. of uh, we, We're going to do points, lines, planes, and triangles. So what is a point? Um, so here's the real trouble when you try and do an axiomatization of something. is like you can't define a point. So we're trying to give a definition of a point. But we are trying to give it in a way without any other definitions that we've already known, right? If you've ever done like grammar in school and you've tried to use a word in a certain, define a word, they say you can't use the word in the definition, right? You can't do anything recursive. So you can't define, it's wrong to say a point is the end of a line because now you have to define a line. Maybe the line is defined as between two points. So you can't say it that way. Um, so the definitions are sort of useless when you start out. And uh, Euclid's definition and these are sort of English maladapted, but he calls it, a point is uh, that which has uh, no part. What does that mean? Uh, so if something has no parts, then it is a point. Mm, uncomfortable, but maybe that's like the best you can do. Uh, his definition of a line is a breathless... So if you have a length, that's a line. OK, fine. Uh, and then it's breathless. So the line has uh, length, but no width, basically. That makes sense to what we understand intuitively. Uh, so that's a point, and that's a line. Right. That's, um, he goes on for several more definitions. He defines what a right angle is. He defines what an obtuse angle is, what an acute angle is. Uh, that is which more than an, an obtuse angle is that is which is more than a right angle, you know, and so on. And uh, he got so he, he gives some twenty six or twenty nine definitions, and then he gives these five what are called postulates. These first five postulates again he has six books full of theorems and proofs. Um, uh, but let's just give the first five because these are the important ones. Uh, one, any two points may be connected by a line segment. And again, this seems ridiculous and useless, but we're going to talk about it. So the definition, first of all, you can't do something unless the axioms say you can. So here, in order to draw a line segment between two points, he has to be able to say that you can. So that's the first axiom. Um, any line segment uh, may be extended infinitely. in both uh, directions. So this defines that not only uh, points exist and lines between two points exist, but then you can grow a line, you can produce a line beyond uh, extending infinitely through the plane. So this uh, that's, defines lines given line segments. Three, all right angles equal each other. Again, this mirrors our intuition, so it's a good axiom. But if it may be required to have it as an axiom in order to use it in some proof. Um, actually, that was axiom four. Doesn't really matter because we don't really care about these. Um, for any point. And radius, uh, there exists a circle. So given a point and given a radius, uh, then there exists a circle. So we've now defined that circles exist. And five, and this is the kind of the important one that we care about. It's kind of the weird one. Uh, given a line L and a point P uh, not on L, there exists exactly one line through 
um, P parallel uh, to L. Yeah. So given a line L, so we have some line L, and given a point P, put P here, I guess, uh, there exists exactly one line through P parallel to L. So if I were to draw a line through P, there's only one of those, all, of all the lines that could go through P, only one of them is parallel to L. And previously he has some definition of what it means for line, two lines to be parallel. Uh, two lines are, are parallel if they never intersect. Two, well, two, points, two lines are explicitly not parallel if they share a point. Um, right, certainly if the angles between them are anything uh, less than 90 degrees, then they'll, con they'll meet over there and diverge over there, right? Um, so I don't really care actually about uh, geometry any more than I care about linguistics, but it's it's an application uh, that we need to know for two reasons. Well, we don't even need to know it, it's, it, but it's important I think for two reasons. One is this like uh, uh, Platonic, say Plato's theory of forms. So uh, a triangle is not a real object; it is a concept. And uh, you, it's an ideal. So it's a thing that we say exists, but it's immaterial. So you have a, you may have a real triangle in some sense. Like you may have, uh, you may draw a triangle in the sand with some, with a stick, or you may assemble three sticks together to form a triangle. But these are real triangles, and these are, of course, imperfect, but they are material. A, Im, a, the, a triangle is an ideal, and the whole thing about Plato's theory of, theory of forms is that. Concepts exist in a way that's prior to the objects that exist. So, for example, Plato would say that beauty exists as itself an object, is an ideal. Uh, and objects may have beauty, but those are the real, uh, those are real things. But beauty itself is a concept, which is an object, which is prior to things that may be beautiful. And in some sense, uh, Euclidean geometry is all ideal. It's all about imaginary dots and lines and points and in some sense, it may help you accidentally build a house. For example, you could derive Pythagorean theorem and use it to prove something fine. Um, and maybe it helps you cut the right length of wood. Uh, these are only, um, you know, nice, uh, a nice consequence, almost accidental. Uh, but the point itself is, is, is it's just made up uh, for the fun of it, uh, sort of. The idea that concepts themselves are things uh, is, is kind of important to mathematics because numbers aren't real, right? Numbers, uh, that's a symbol I write on the board which represents a quantity of two. But two itself as an idea is independent of the objects that it may represent two. Two bananas, two monkeys, whatever. Two itself is, is that. And this is something that comes from uh, Plato. A second reason, uh, well, back closer to the first reason, is that... Um, so logic or the way we think about things may be intuitive, but if you have things defined, that you, then you can't disagree with them, right? So no one, you can argue if a set of axioms are good or not, but given the set of axioms, there is no room for debate if they say a certain thing or not, because you can, you can prove something via the axioms, you prove it. Um, to, to have a proof within a system, for example, within Euclidean geometry, you would have certain rules of deduction, and the rules of deduction would themselves be uh, axioms. So you can talk about if an axiomatic system is good or not, but within, uh, within the axiomatic system, it's supposed to be totally objective. So this is uh, kind of a, an idea of objectivity. Um, a second reason is historical. So this, it, this is from 300 BC, and it is... Um, Historically, uh, the, the, the starting point of like rationality and rigorous and systematic thinking. So I have a quote, actually, from Abraham Lincoln here. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. So, at last I said, Lincoln, you can never make a lawyer if you do not understand what demonstrate means. And I left my situation in Springfield, went home to my father's house, and stayed there till they could give any proposition in the six books of Euclid at sight. The, I then found out what demonstrate means and went back to my law studies. And then here's a note from 1854, which is unpublished, also by Lincoln. He uses, he uses this kind of rigorous and systematic thinking that he learned from Euclid's elements to assert a position of abolition. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may of right enslave B, 
why may, may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that, me he, that he may enslave A? You say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with fairer skin than your own. You do not mean color exactly. You mean the whites are intellectually the superior of the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave of the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But say you, it is a question of interest, and if you can make it an interest, you have a right to enslave another. Very well, and if he can make it his interest, then he has the right to enslave you. So some quick remarks about this is that he doesn't say, uh, he doesn't talk in specifics here. He's talking, you know, person A and person B, and he's talking about a hypothetical, uh, you know, why slavery is not immoral in this specific passage, but illogical. So he comes to an, a logical conclusion following several truths. So let's say this person says they have the right to enslave the other, then someone else may have the right to enslave the slaver, right? Something like this. So certainly, a, following this argument this way is um, a logical uh, argument against slavery. There's, of course, many, many more moral arguments against slavery, but logical thinking is something relatively, like in terms of human history, relatively new, like past couple hundred years. Um, you know, John, John Brown was also an abolitionist, but he was, uh, he had a moral um, right against slavery. He, he believed slavery, so Lincoln here displays that he believes slavery is illogical. He probably also believes it's immoral. Uh, John Brown, you know, do you know John Brown? No? John Brown rose, he bleeding Kansas, can, uh, bleeding Kansas, he started uh, like a slave rebellion, and he believed he was, an, uh, he was a weapon of God, and that um, slavery was immoral, and as a Christian, he had to rise up and uh, end slavery through force. So, you know, I don't know if it's a real quote, but he's like, you know, face the judgment of the Lord, slaver, and then bam, Killed many people, well, slavers, not people, but, uh, so, John Brown was acting, though, he thought, you know, he's a hand of God, he's a weapon of God, he thought, he's acting in a position of morality, right, so he believes, not logically, that slavery, slavery is evil, but morally, so maybe something logical, something dialectical, a discussion, may not be able to convince John Brown, uh, that's okay. I mean, still right, but it's 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 a, it's a demonstration of the kind of logical thinking that the elements brought uh, throughout history. So those from 300 BC, um, it has historically been like the second most, the second biggest printing in history, like second to the Bible. It's been like um, uh, there are copies of it that have been found in Arabic for by Islamic scholars and and in China and so on. And it. You're given these six books, and you can go online and see some of the books, and we'll do one proof today. But the, I want to stress that the point is I don't really care about um, geometry itself, but I care about axiomatic thinking because it's important to the problem that we want to solve. You have some set of rules, axioms, and you work within those rules to drive truth, some nature of truth. So um, 2,000 years to think about the same thing is plenty of time. Um, to think if these are good rules or not, right? So many, a lot of time was spent not just proving things, like, uh, I don't know, a rectangle, all rectangles have four 90-degree angles or something, right? That's not an axiom, but you can prove that. In fact, you can prove it from the fifth axiom. Um, so a lot of time was spent not just proving things, but also determining if these were a good... Uh, set of axioms. So like, of the first five axioms, only one of them seems kind of weird. The rest seem kind of obvious. Okay, fine. You can concede maybe you can't prove them. But the fifth one seems kind of weird. Like, uh, well, well, this is called also the parallel postulate or Euclid's fifth postulate. So this is also called like, uh, we'll call it PP. So um, we say like an axiomatic, for any axiomatic system, for an axiomatic system AS, uh, And for a theorem, T, uh, we write the axiomatic system, and then we write this symbol, uh, T, if the added axiomatic system can prove theorem T. So a theorem is proved, an axiom is assumed. A theorem um, 
Well, so what's the difference between a theorem or a lemma or a corollary? You know, off the top of your head. The difference between an axiom and a theorem or a theorem? A or theorem, a lemma, or a corollary? Uh, okay, so theorem is something that's proved by the axioms. Okay. Corollary is something that's a consequence of the theorem. And lemma... I know you read papers and they say lemma and then they mm -hmm. prove it later. I guess yes. it's something you need to prove your... It's like a claim. Right. So that's perfect. What I'm really... I guess what I'm really asking is like... Uh, so the answer is kind of that it's arbitrary. Right? right. So if an axiomatic system can prove a theorem and then a theorem proves a corollary, then the axiomatic system can prove the corollary. Right? So the corollary is really just also a theorem. So lemmas, theorems, and corollaries are all just theorems, turns out. Um, but it's a, relative, uh, it's a relative idea about which, kind of which order they come from. Like lemmas may be used to prove some theorem. Right? So these are lemmas, theorems. And then a theorem may accidentally follow like a corollary, kind of, like as a mental map. That's what it looks like. So kind of lemmas are, feel prior to theorems. Theorems feel main. And then corollaries feel like they come as an extra, as an aside, as a dessert. Um, and if you kind of think of it this way, logically, all the statements which are provable kind of seem to fit into some sort of tree. It wouldn't be an acyclic tree, though, because you can prove two statements are equivalent, if and only if, right? Maybe there's some other theorem t here. And here I'm using arrows as kind of an implication. So you would do, if you did an if, if and only if for t and t prime, you would do something like that. That would kind of what it looks like. Uh, but it still seems like a tree because... Um, as you prove more theorems, you go forward in some direction. So then maybe what happens if you go backwards? Like, if, to consider all the statements you assumed were true to prove a theorem, how did, how did you know those were true? Are they themselves axioms, or are they proved themselves from other things, right, and so on? Like, maybe you use a prime number theorem, you know, whatever. So somehow you can go backwards in this big tree of knowledge. And eventually, you go backwards enough, you're only going to hit the axioms. And among the axioms are going to be the rules of deduction. So... Uh, people were cons this is what this notation basically means for an axiomatic system to prove some theorem. So people were concerned uh, if the fifth axiom needed to be an axiom. So basically, we would write that as like Euclid's elements. We'll write EE for Euclid's elements without the parallel postulate. Uh, can this prove the parallel postulate? So if you don't have if you don't assume the parallel postulate, postulate. Can the parallel postulate follow as a theorem instead of an axiom? Do you need to assume it in order to get all of the geometry that you want, all the nice things that you want? And of course, there are many more axioms and definitions and things that I haven't given here. So it's not just looking at these four things, you know, all right angles equal each other, circles exist. It's not obvious how you would even get the parallel postulate at all. Um, also in that list is not the definition of parallel, obviously. But it's not certain. It, it, people tried for a long time to prove maybe the parallel postulate was necessary, um, that you couldn't prove it. So what's one way if you needed to prove that an axiom was necessary for a system? So suppose, consider the system without the axiom. Like if we were talking about arithmetic, consider what happens if you could not use associativity of addition. What would happen? Would bad things happen? Or let's say multiplic let's say the a commutativity of, a, of, of, of multiplication. Let's say AB equals BA. What happens if you couldn't assume that? That's an axiom, uh, AB equals BA. What, what, what would happen if you couldn't assume that AB equals BA? Would you be able to prove the same things? It's not obvious, right? What happens if instead of assuming AB, you can't assume AB equals BA, and maybe you can't derive it as theorem. What happens if you assume AB does not equal BA? What are the consequences of all the theorems you've ever proved that require commutativity of addition. What happens if you can't assume uh, AB equals BA? What would you think would happen? I'm just curious. You couldn't use um, the distributive property correctly. You couldn't use the A plus B whole squared. So the distributive property I'm thinking is like A B plus C is equal to AB plus AC. Right, sorry. So I meant like A plus B whole squared. You get that equals A squared plus B squared. Oh. Plus 2AB. But you get 2AB because you assume that AB equals BA. Yes, that's true. That, that's very yeah. true, right? This, would, this is like what? A squared plus AB plus BA plus B squared, something like that? Yeah. But not B plus C. But, you know, right. yeah. So yeah. then you, don't, you only get that collapse. That's true. Um, and then and for fact, all the higher powers. 
Correct. And then, like, if this, if you, if instead you assume the negation, you would get that this does not equal uh, a squared plus two ab plus b squared. Right. Correct. This, by the way, commutativity is not true for matrices. So when you do foil matrices, right, right. you have to keep them separate. Um, and then you could like maybe unfoil this back, and then you would get like that's a plus b squared. Something. I don't know. It's complicated. Is, is that a ring when you can't have commutativity? Commutative ring. Oh, commut. Oh, yeah. You just you can have a commutative ring, yeah. which is not a field. Right. Don't remember. But yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I think a ring in general is not. Actually, I think it depends on the definition. I was, I was, I was thinking about this. I, uh, I think it depends if whose book you use if you assume the ring is commutative or not. I so, I don't know. One way people tried to prove that the parallel postulate was necessary for Euclidean geometry is to see the consequences of what happens if you assume all the axioms of Euclid, you don't have the parallel postulate, but then you add in a negation of the parallel postulate. What are the consequences of this? What happens if you take the logical negation of the parallel postulate? So hopefully, the motivation for this was that they hope to prove uh, that 0 equals 1. Okay? If you can prove 0 equals 1, all hands are off the table. If you can assume a falsehood, then it turns out any statement, every statement follows from something false. So there's no reason to, everything is both simultaneously true and false. You have, it's called consistency. We'll talk about this uh, later today. But if you can prove this, that given the Euclidean axiom, given uh, Euclidean geometry with the negation of the parallel postulate, if you can prove an inconsistency, then um, bad things happen. So perhaps this is, this is good evidence in favor that the parallel postulate is good and assumed, right? Certainly, it's negation is not, so we might as well take it as an axiom, independent of the fact that if we can prove it or not. And instead, uh, something terrible happened. Um, uh, instead of, it didn't produce uh, an inconsistency. It produced, instead, uh, two consistent models. So instead, this produced two uh, consistent So assuming the negation, so Euclidean, uh, Euclid's elements with the parallel postulate appear consistent. It doesn't appear you can prove 0 equals 1. If you assume the negation of the parallel postulate, it turns out you also can't prove 0 equals 1 because it appears to be consistent. A model is consistent if 0 equals 1, if there does not exist a proof that 0 equals 1. And a model is, in some sense, just an interpretation of the theorems. Like, what are the, given some set of axioms, what are the implications of the, um, or f what are the theorems that follow from those axioms, and how do we interpret them? Um, so here's the statement of the parallel postulate. Given a line L and a point P not on L, there exists exactly one line through P parallel to L. What would you think the logical negation of this is? So I think, so this, I think saying um, a line is uniquely, deter uniquely determined by a point in a slope. Okay. So the negation, I think, would be a line is not uniquely determined through a point or slope, so there could be multiple lines. Sure. So I'm actually going to take two negations of it, just to break it up into two cases. Um, but yes, the, logically, if you just took the statement and added the negation through it, what would we negate is that this, exi this, state, this part here, where it says exactly one line through P, it would be not exactly one line through P. Right. So I would write this twice. Um, I guess I can go over here. So it would have to be two cases because none or more than one? Exactly. It doesn't have to be two cases, but it turns out that the two models assume two different cases. So it's just going to be easier for me to write it. So that's the parallel postulate. I'm going to say uh, the negation of PP1, and that's the first... Uh, that's the negation of parallel postulate with this first interpretation, and it's going to be a given a line L and a point P uh, not on L. Uh, there exists, uh, we'll say no lines through a P parallel to L. 
And then we'll say the negation of the parallel postulate 2 is uh, given a line L and point P on not on L. There exists uh, more than one one line uh, through P parallel to L. My handwriting legible there. Basically, the, the normal parallel postulate, oh, I'll just write here for completion. The normal parallel postulate says, uh, you know, given a line L, given a line L, uh, and a point P not on L, there exists exactly one line through P parallel to L. In some sense, this is the case that uh, the number of lines through P is equal to 1. The negation, I'm just calling them 1 and 2 arbitrarily. Um, this, the negation 1 is as if there's uh, less than 1 lines through P parallel to L and more than 1, so greater than 1. So these are the three cases, really. Less than 1 lines through P parallel to L, more than 1 lines through P parallel to L, and exactly 1 line through P parallel to L. That's really what the, uh, what the assumption is of, uh, uh, of parallelity. That's not a word. But first off, what does it really mean? So in a Euclidean sense, the parallel, so again, the axiomatization, you have some intuitive understanding of what Euclidean geometry is. It doesn't feel like there should be no line through P parallel to L, and it doesn't feel like there should be more than one line through P parallel to L. So, uh, but it turns out that you don't, even though that doesn't seem to match our intuition about Euclidean geometry, it's not incorrect. Like, you still can't prove 0 equals 1. So you get um, so under the, under the uh, parallel postulate, Euclidean geometry looks like this. You exist on a plane somewhere. Uh, lines are parallel, and they're what we consider like Euclidean lines. They look like that. Uh, all triangles have interior sum of 180 degrees. Exactly right. This interior. The, the 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 interior sum of a ang the sum of the interior angles of a triangle equals 180 degrees, right? And lines kind of look like that. That's what the parallel lines look like. Um, let's do PP1 first. So the negation PP1. Uh, if what does it really mean for given a line P and uh, there does not exist a line uh, through P parallel to L? So basically, if we're given a line L and a point P. What does it kind of mean for there to not be, like, it's never parallel? It, it never can go off infinitely. It has to intersect. It turns out that this looks like, uh, this actually is not a model of Euclidean geometry, but a spherical geometry. Um, so in spherical geometry, the lines are great circles. The lines are those which go basically like an equator. Um, and that's what a line is according to the axioms of Euclidean geometry, but with this negation of the parallel postulate. You take the axioms and you reprove all the theorems, but now all the theorems are slightly different. So basically, any two lines, any two great circles on a sphere have to intersect, right? It's maybe not the best art, but one is going this way, the other is going this way, right? And those are the, those are the behind the lines. Every two great circle, a great circle is a circle on a sphere that touches, that is maximal in length. For example, this is not a great circle uh, because anything that's not a great circle on a sphere is not a line, it's a curve. By Euclid's definition of what a line is, turns out a great circle is a line. And any two great circles on a sphere always intersect or an ellipsoid. Um, it also turns out that the triangles do not have exactly 180 degrees. Instead, you can have triangles of greater than 180 degrees. Start at the North Pole, go south, turn 90 degrees, uh, go up and go back to the surface, 90 degrees. This is 270 degrees. You can have a triangle of air, of, you can have a triangle on a sphere of interior angles of 270 degrees. Think about one-eighth of the sphere. You could picture it. You have three right angles. 
That's 270 degrees. That's not 180 degrees, though. Um, and it turns out, if you were to build a triangle with, uh, if you, with a 180 degree interior on a sphere, then the limit of the area of the triangle approaches zero. So the smaller the triangle is, uh, the closer the interior sum of the angles will equal 180. And only when the triangle has area zero, which is a triangle of a single point, which is not a triangle anymore, will the interior sum be a 180. So every triangle uh, has uh, area st strictly greater than 180, right? So the lines, the curves, and the, and the triangles look like this in this model. So this is a model. You have some set of axioms, but now with a different axiom instead of the parallel postulate, we have the negation of the parallel postulate in this way, and we have this case. And this, notice, though, although this is not Euclidean geometry, this is a weird world with circles, we don't have uh, any inconsistency. Uh, 0 equals 1 is false still. We were not able to prove 0 equals 1. So it's not inconsistent. It's just a different world. It's just consistent, but with different rules slightly different rules. Um, what do you think that the negation of the parallel postulate 2 looks like? Totally don't expect anyone to get this. But as a hint, if PP equals 1 is flat, is Euclidean, PP, if the number of lines is 0, is spherical, what kind of geometry would PP2 look like? Two or more lines. It's like it should be like a three D shape. Yeah. Certainly, it won't be flat. Right. This is not an easy question. It's... Is it one of the common ones? One of the what? It, it's not like a paraboloid or something. It is called hyperbolic. Oh. Basically, the curvature cannot be constant, um, but is it, if you alternate directions, it has to go. One way or the other. I didn't plan to draw this, actually. Let's see. Follow my picture. It's a Pringle. Everyone knows what a Pringle looks like, right? Explain geometry to an American, you use food, right? So, okay, that makes it clear. Certainly like a Pringle. Um, why does this work like this? Well, given a line and a point not on that line, there exists more than one line through P parallel to L. What does that mean? Well, you can have, certainly you have the nice one, but then you have these other lines through the point which are parallel. So it looks like this, though. The lines, again, don't appear straight. Like they don't. Same, same thing with the spherical world. And what that looks like is going to be like, uh, so you're given a line and a point not on that line. There exist perhaps believable that I give you a point and a line on a Pringle. You can embed three lines into the point, which are all parallel, defined parallel to L. And only from certain angles would they look straight. Um, it's also true, though, that the interior sum of a triangle um, is uh, less than 180 degrees. So if you embed a triangle in hyperbolic geometry, also called uh, Boyai Gaussian Lobachevsky geometry, because many people figured this out at the same time, uh, do you get something weird? as well. So rather than go through, like, given the set of axioms, try and reprove uh, that that's what these worlds look like. Again, wait, before I do that, though, I want to stress, though, this is a consistent model of geometry. It's uh, 0 equals 1 is false in this world. Okay? You cannot prove 0 equals 1. All the theorems of Euclidean geometry are still true theorems, um, but they're just slightly different. Okay? Like, the you would not be able to prove that a triangle has interior angles of 180 degrees following 
this model given this set of axioms. Uh, same thing for this set of axioms. Rather than explore all the theorems of these two models and show that they're consistent and, get, and prove that you know, this is what the curves look like, this is what the triangles look like, I'm going to just do one proof of Euclidean geometry, um, which is I, hopefully enough to convince, I mean, it convinced me. It, it requires uh, some justification about why the models look like this. You know, why, does it, why do the theorems of this model look like, yes, look like why a hyperbolic? Why is zero equals one the litmus test? It is the most primitive version of uh, a truth. So certainly, like, if A equals B, then that implies that A plus 1 equals B plus 1, right? Right. So 1 equals 2 is also a litmus test. I see. 0 equals 1 is just the 1 equals 2 implies the assumption of one more axiom. 0 equals 1, certainly. Some, and even, even before you can assume quantity exists, this is really... Um, Prior to that, this is nothing is equal to something, right? That's a good question. You can also just assume an inconsistency as an axiom and see what happens, and then everything is true and false simultaneously, right? We don't want to, we want to study only the consistent and useful models of arithmetic uh, or geometry or, or sets or whatever. We don't want to study what happens if... You can just make anything up anyway, right? We want to show the consequences of real, of the, of the, of real things. Um, so I'm going to do, so bef before I do the next thing, I want, to, I want to say that it also requires justification uh, that the parallel postulate, we, we now know that the parallel postulate is independent. That is to say, the Euclidean axioms uh, of Euclid's elements minus the parallel postulate uh, cannot prove uh, the parallel postulate. What does that mean? You cannot take the parallel postulate as a theorem. It has to be taken as an axiom. So by choosing which version of the parallel postulate, you are deciding which model of geometry you want to work in. By the way, I think for three-dimensional Euclidean geometry, the 3D version of the parallel postulate, there are eight models. So there are three models of this, there's eight models of that, and then you get into weird... Maybe what you were saying, like parabolic, hyperbolic stuff, right? Um, so you can't, and this proof is beyond us. It takes, might take a full lecture, and I'm not that interested in that. But you should know that you can't prove it. So what does it mean for an axiom to be independent or an axiomatic state, a, an axiomatic system to be independent? It just means an axiomatic system uh, is independent if no axiom is provable from the rest. What does that mean? Like, if you think of a linear independence in a vector space, the basis of a vector space, uh, a, a basis is independent. The vectors of a basis are independent of each other if no linear combination of the other vectors can produce one of those vectors, right? Similar for a, if no combination of the other axioms can produce a proof of a statement, then that statement, we would say, is independent of the axioms. It's not provable from that axiom. So you just take it as an axiom itself. So we, know, we now know that the parallel postulate is uh, independent. Um, the other axioms are too trivial to not be independent, basically. That's the reason they're independent. Um, what I'm going to prove to you, though, is that the parallel postulate is logically equivalent to uh, there exists a triangle uh, whose interior angle sum is uh, 180 degrees. So the existence of a triangle whose interior angle is summed to 180 degrees is, and turns out, a perfect characterization of the parallel postulate. If you can build a triangle with interior angle sum of 180 degrees, you have to be living in a flat world, and then therefore the parallel postulate is true. If you assume the parallel postulate is true, you can derive that the fact there exists a triangle with whose interior angles are 180 degrees. In fact, you may have seen one direction of this proof in like high school level uh, geometry. Right? If you may have proven that the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees and implicitly assumed the parallel postulate. That's probably what happened. But it turns out the reverse implication, and I have to search pretty hard for the reverse, uh, the reverse implication uh, as a proof online. So I'm doing this really to demonstrate, one, what kind of proofs 
ex like how do proofs in Euclidean geometry work? What do they look like? And two, to show that these are to give some evidence in favor that the, we have two consistent, different models, but the, they're not inconsistent. They're consistent, just different. All right. So first, let's do the first way. Um, uh, one more final thing about, about, about proof in general. So like applying the elements in general for any axiomatic system, right now we're just talking about geometry. We'll talk about sets of numbers later. It's about rigor. So what you, in order to make a statement, it has to be justified through the axioms themselves. However, when you do mathematical proof, normally it's an English paragraph. It's, um, it's, it's prose. There's flow that, that happens with it. Um, how do we combine these two? The fact is that if you were to do a proof from the axioms every time you were asked to do a proof, it would be long and arduous and really boring uh, and really messy. So in fact, you simplify it by making, again, some small atomic statements that are English sentences, which are themselves true from the axioms, but you don't, it's really implicit what axioms you're applying to this. So this proof is slightly more rigorous. It's not as rigorous as it should be, but I'm going to try and give it as a, as a rigorous proof in order to uh, kind of show uh, what it looks like. So um, I'm just going to do it as a sequence of bullet points. Uh, let uh, A, B, C be a triangle uh, with uh, D produced from uh, B, C. So what does that mean? Maybe I'll put it over here. Like, um, we have triangle point here. We have A. We have B. And we have C. So A, B, C is a triangle. OK, fine. Triangles exist. We have not assumed yet that the triangle interior sum is 180 degrees. It only looks like that because I'm drawing on a board. Right? Um, and then B, and then D is produced from B, C. What does that mean? It means you go like. So again, by the axioms, you can extend the line infinitely out in both directions. Here we're extending it out to some point D. Okay? We're not even saying that the lines are straight. That's an assumption of Euclidean geometry. Um, but we, get, we do get to assume the parallel postulate. Uh, but we're not assuming that triangle has interior angle some 180 degrees. Um, Choose uh, E uh, such that uh, a, the line AB is parallel uh, to CE. So now we're constructing a line CE and a point E implicitly such that the line CE is parallel to AB. So what does that look like? Uh, by the parallel postulate, there exists exactly one line through uh, C. I feel like it's timing out quicker now. So this is what our, uh, our definition is so far. Let E be this point such that the line CE is parallel to B to AB. So CE is parallel to AB. Now what do we know about um, um, AC compared to AB versus CE? Let's see if you remember any high school geometry. Most people opted out of it to calculus, but let's see if you remember. What is the what is the fact the fact that A, B, and C E are parallel? What does A C tell us? What do we know about A C in general? This is too vague of a question, I think. Is, is A A C equal to A C E? Perfect. Since A C is a traversal between two parallel lines, those two angles have to be equivalent. And why is that true? That's by the parallel postulate. So by the parallel postulate, uh, AC is a traversal. So uh, angle uh, BAC is equal to angle uh, ACE. And this notation is not defined. I haven't defined it, but it's pretty obvious what's going on, right? Because I'm saying it out loud. OK. So that, that is true. That is a traversal. Now, um, so AC is a traversal, but so is BD. 
right? So what does that mean? That means ABC is equal to ECD. You guys know what these hash marks mean? These, these angles are the same, right? So similarly, by parallel postulate, uh, BD is a traversal. Line BD is a traversal. So um, angle ABC is equal to angle ECD, right? Now, it should be obvious what the conclusion is here, but just we'll finish the proof. This is the third angle. It's going to complete the triangle, but also it's going to complete this 180 degrees. So those have to be the same. That's just what it turns out. Um, so ACD, so just some arithmetic here. Uh, ACD, the angle ACD is going to be equal to ACE plus ECD. Um, but this is just the, but we can apply the previous two theorems and just do a substitution here to get that this is equal to, um, well, ACE is equal to BAC and ECD is equal to ABC, right? So we get ACE plus ECD is equal to BAC plus AP, A, ABC. Um, now we're going to just, uh, we want to complete it, so we're going to add ACB, uh, ACB to both sides. So we're going to get ACE plus ECD plus ACB is equal to BAC plus ABC plus, um, what did I say was ACB? Okay. ACE plus ECD plus ACB is what? This is just 180 degrees. By the way, in all the old books, they don't call it 180 degrees. They say two right angles. So, uh, BAC plus ABC plus ACB is just the interior angle sum. This is the interior, this is the interior sum. This is the interior angle sum of a triangle. So we've getting that the interior angle sum of a triangle equals 180 degrees. Um, another... One more final remark about this proof before I, before I do the reverse implication is that equality actually was invented like a uh, thousand years later or something because the fact that you can move terms around and you consider like a balance of the equation um, took a lot longer. So they would have worded this, you know, very differently. Um, still correct, but the idea that you can do this kind of, some, this kind, uh, kind of balance manipulation uh, Arithmetic came much later than uh, geometry, even if it was implicit, you know. So uh, uh, one more final remark about this proof is that it, it's done for any triangle. We assumed that like, we, did, we started with let ABC be a triangle, and that's just some triangle. And then the next things, uh, the proof works for any triangle. So this, is, this shows every triangle has interior angle sum uh, 180 degrees, if you assume the parallel postulate. So now I want to do the reverse. I want to show that the parallel postulate is true uh, given the fact that there exists a triangle whose interior angle sum is 180 degrees. Now, this proof is actually slightly much harder. Oh, this proof, by the way, is not the shortest proof that the interior angle sum comes from uh, is 180 degrees, but it comes from, I wrote it down. This is book one uh, proposition, so the 32nd proof of book one uh, of Euclid. So that's uh, like a, this proof is 2,300 years old. Uh, this next proof is from, I think it's from Satchery in like the 1700s. So again, still some old ancient math here. We want to assume that a, assume that a triangle whose angle sum uh, equals 180 degrees, and we want to prove that the parallel postulate is true. 
So um, uh, let L be a line A point not on L. So what does that look like? We have L is a line and A is a point uh, not on L, right? Let uh, B be the foot of A such that uh, AB is perpendicular to L, right? So what we're going to do is given A, we're going to drop a line from A uh, specifically so it's perpendicular. Notice we're not having any assumptions on parallelity yet because we want to prove the parallel postulate given this interior angle sum is 180 degrees. So we drop the foot and we call this point B from A, okay? And we just say it's perpendicular. Uh, one of the axioms of previous axioms is that all right angles are equal to each other. So right angle certainly exists, so that is a right angle. We can say we maybe can't define uniqueness of parallelity because we're trying to prove that, but we can certainly say perpendicular exists. Um, choose a C on L where C does not equal B. We're going to choose C over here. That's just some point. Uh, ABC is a right triangle with uh, interior angle sum 180 degrees. Right. So this is a right triangle. Oops. This is a right triangle with interior angle sum 180 degrees. Um, construct line M uh, through A such that uh, M is perpendicular to AB. This is line M, and it's perpendicular to AB. Now, if we have a line which is perpendicular to a line, and that line is perpendicular to a different line, what do we know about M and L? Yeah. Yes. M and L are parallel. Um, now, notice that we didn't define M to be parallel. We constructed M to be parallel. So we are we, M is not parallel as defined, but as a consequence of the fact that we constructed AB to be perpendicular this way, right? This is a right angle, and this is a right angle. So now how do you prove that L... We want to prove that M is unique. M is the only line through A which is parallel to L. We want to prove that there's no other line um, uh, through there. So first I'm going to do this. Uh, choose a D on M. So we're going to choose D over here somewhere. We'll do here. Now, if A, D, and B, C are parallel to each other, because M and L are parallel, that means A, C is a traversal between those two, right? What does that mean? That means D, A, C is equal to ACB. So DAC equals ACB. Okay, fine. Suppose M prime exists uh, through D, through, excuse me, through A parallel. Uh, 2L. So M we constructed to be parallel. Suppose, assume that there is a distinct other line, M prime, through point A, which is parallel uh, uh, 
uh, through M. And if I were to draw it, and I'm, we want to show that we, so we want to show that uh, M prime equals M, right? That's sufficient for us to conclude that M was unique. Um, if I don't, I don't want to draw it, but if I had to draw it, it might look something like this. Right. Um, since M prime is parallel to L, uh, AC is a traversal. Choose D prime on M prime. So uh, the angle D prime AC is equal to ACB, right? What does that mean? That means this is equal to this. But D prime AC equals ACB. We already know that DAC equals ACB. So from there, we can conclude, actually, there's an explicit definition uh, by Euclid. I forget which number it is, but it's like things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. So if DAC equals ACB and D and D prime AC D prime AC equals ACB and DAC equals ACB, that can only conclude that DAC equals DAC prime. So we get the fact that uh, a D prime AC is equal to uh, DAC, and then from there we can only conclude that if the, if the, if if the angle of incidence between uh, for line M and M prime is the same, then they can only be the same line, right? So we conclude that uh, M is a unique line through P and that uh, the parallel postulate is true. And all of this followed implic implicitly from the fact that the interior angle sum of the triangle is 180 degrees, we get to assume the angle of incidence in the traversal step, right? So... What's the point of this? So I wanted to do this proof, these proofs really to show you what a, a proof in Euclidean geometry looked like, what mathematical proof looked like for 2,000 years, um, until we really did stuff in the turn of the century, uh, right around when George Cantor came out. We talked about diagonalization last time. Um, the second reason is that uh, this had profound implications beyond uh, geometry. It was really nothing short of a scientific revolution. So uh, I'm speaking out of my league here, but I think there's some story about like Kant or Kant. Um, he like uses geometry as, as an example of something which is neither uh, logically deduced or, under, or learned through senses. It's somehow universal and apparent to all of us in a way that is not learned. We are somehow, and he uses this as a justification, an example that we are born with knowledge in some way. The parallel postulate seems obviously true, even if there's no justification where you can make, make it true, make why it's true. You know, given a line, a point not on the line, there exists exactly one line through that point, parallel. That seems like that's the way the world works, and because uh, you, that's why the world maybe seems flat to us. However, Kant kind of makes this assumption that the, that the geometry, which is universal to us, is in fact the Euclidean geometry. So he would not have been an axiom kind of guy. He, would have, he wouldn't have bothered writing down the axioms. He would have said, you know, there's some intuitive reason for all these theorems to be true, so we just, I'll, I'll follow my intuition uh, only. I wouldn't have to uh, write down rules and then try and follow those rules. Um, something like this. So the fact that there existed now three consistent models of geometry, none of which were contradictory, there's no contradiction within either, any of them, and we now know these models are consistent. We can prove these models are are consistent, um, is kind of a blow to this kind of thinking. So what does it really mean? Can we trust our senses? Uh, it's, not, it's not really clear what it means for what is the real geometry. And you know, the Earth isn't flat either, so maybe all the math we've been doing is spherical anyway. So who's to say that our intuition about uh, what's guiding us about Euclidean geometry is correct at all? Um, and then the next more serious and more important question came about is, okay, geometry, fine, I don't care about geometry. Uh, what about the rest of mathematics? How do we know that the theorems, uh, all the axioms of number theory are, and of numbers and functions, how do we know that those are also good axioms? How do we know the model that they, those axioms represent 
is a good model. Like one of the axioms off the top of my head is probably something like, I don't know, A equals B implies A plus one equals B plus one. Actually, that's the same one I said previous. Uh, right? Something like this. How do we know that the, this is true for numbers? If it's certainly true intuitively. I have 10 bananas and 10 bananas, 10 apples. Oh my god. 10 bananas, 10 apples. Now I have 11 bananas, 11 apples. You know, obviously it's, uh, How do we know that the axioms of number theory that we, we maybe haven't rigorously defined but are intuitively understood, how do we know that they model correctly the quantity and structure that we want them to? So this, this was a crisis in, in geometry that made everyone panic and realize maybe we were on shaking foundations and inspired the next 100, 200 years of mathematical research into making sure the axioms were good. So like as a, we'll talk about foundations of number theory after the break in a second, but I just want to quickly mention one more final sentence is that, so um, Euclid's elements are of course historic and old and he actually didn't do a good job of proving certain things because some of his theorems, some of his axioms turns out can be theorems. So there's a guy named David Hilbert and uh, Hilbert rigorously took uh, what we call now Hilbert's axioms, um, he took the axioms of Euclid and really s systematized them and did a really good job of the proofs and theorems and results. So he, his, 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 his model of Euclidean geometry is now the standard one that we take when we're studying Euclidean geometry. And Euclid is really more of a his historical thing. Okay? When we come back, we'll talk about um, sets and numbers.